Iba Amalam Mutakabala. So in this um, so in this last session we're going to have the panel of the graduates and the students in the Jamiat al Islamiya. And we're going to ask them some questions related to their seeking of knowledge and some of their experiences be in Allah Ta'ala. So we'll begin with our brother Muhammad Rahman. And the first question is Muhammad, you have studied in Cardiff where you're from before you left and you memorized the majority of the Quran you memorize and you learn some of the different funun. When you travel to seek knowledge abroad, what are some of the things that you benefited abroad that you could not have in Cardiff and some for what related to that? Tfadda. So, when a Balbin, a person who has studied and has benefited in the West, the reason why I mention that's so important is because if you don't create a habit of studying while you're here, once you go over there, it will be extremely difficult for you to adapt. Adapt to the weather, to the people, the language, the dirasa, studying with the mashayikh in the, the jami'ah or outside of the jami'ah. You have to be a person who has studied before. You have these habits of studying, habits of memorizing, right? So, um, one of the main things that you would benefit, and it's quite obvious, after you leave your city or country is the ilm that you will receive from the teachers and the mashayikh and the ulama that you will come across they are different ways of teaching some of these things you pick up subconsciously the yani, way that they teach the way they break down the ilm for you the way they simplify it for you you will pick up on many of these things some things that you will also pick up on is al adab etiquette, how to deal with the people, how to deal with students. You see the students in front of you, you recognize their level, you bring their in down to their level. If you know they're a little bit more intermediate or more advanced, then you could raise it. And then you would come back and apply the same things that you have learned when you come back to the depth. One of the main things that you will also experience if you go out there is many different life experiences. You might even go through situations where it's life and death. And that happens to many brothers. Some brothers, they get into car accidents. Some get into situations where they're about to die and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves them. You will face many different things. You will go through shortage of money, food, dealing with the people, adapting to the society around you all of these things you have to deal with on top of the fact that you're seeking knowledge and you will see that the only way you can really deal with all of these things is through the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will see that a, a person who goes abroad and he studies and he benefits a lot you will see that it, it molds that person and <coughs> To, to describe it as breaks the person is, is the best way, even though it's not negative in the way that it actually breaks the person. It molds them and forms them in a way that they are they be they, they be from those who are busy in ilm. Their life becomes about ilm. But this comes back to you as a person. Why are you going out there? Are you going out there because everyone else is going out there? Are you going out there because it's a hype and, you know, people beautify it. Because the only time you would really benefit out there is if you're going for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't have the correct intention, which is the most important thing. Why? Because talab al is ibadah. It's ibadah lillahi ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He only raises those who do ibadah for His sake. You will see that the scholars of the past, Just hold it. 
you'll see that the scholars of the past, if you were to ponder over what kept these ulama that lived five, six, seven hundred, maybe even a thousand years ago, kept their, kept their books still existing today to where it's being taught in parts of the world, they would never, ever, ever thought that Muslims would live there. It's because of that sincerity they had for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A perfect example of this is an Imam al nawawi Al Imam al nawawi rahimahullah, he was a man who died at a young age in comparison to many of the other, other scholars who lived at this time and who passed before him. In his 40s, it was said that he died. But look at what he produced. And what he produced and how much of the Ummah benefits from him. The 40 hadith by the Imam al nawawi how many Muslims have memorized it? And studied and taught it. And it's carried on being taught through all, all, all over the world. Al Mu'tamad fi al Shafi'i is a book that's taught, that's written by Imam al nawawi In Haj al every student who studies the Fiqh Shafi'i, if he wants to be faqih, al-faqih, and he's going through al tariqat al-shafi'iyya, he has to study minhaj. On top of the fact that minhaj has so many shuruhat, min al-ta'liqat, wal-hawasi, wal-shuruhat, so many in number. And that's not only the thing he, he, he produced. If you look at ilm al-hadith, and what he has produced in terms of ilm al-hadith, the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of an explanation of Sahih Muslim, is the explanation of Imam al nawawi When you look at some of the more advanced books in Mustalah, what's Tadrib al-Rawi? What is it a sharh of? An ikhtisar of a book that Imam al nawawi did. Imam al nawawi is the one who did the ikhtisar of it. And we could go on for a very, very long time. But what I would say is, when you go out there, on top of the fact that you benefit from the ilm, you learn a lot about yourself as a person and you come to face with what type of person are you in reality and if you don't take advantage of the blessings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you and you try your best to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by asking him for tawfiq if you don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you tawfiq in your seeking of knowledge wallahi or billahi or tawlahi you will never benefit the main fact that you're here right now and benefiting and listening to this is the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you to go and study abroad is tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for you to benefit from that opportunity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, and He gives it to those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he wants khair for, Allah he gives an opportunity to go out and to seek knowledge and to benefit and to learn and to spread and to be from those who are from the carriers of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and spread the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who end up doing the, the, the occupation, the wadifa of the Anbiya. This is a person Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala wants khair for. So if you want to take advantage of these opportunities, be grateful to Allah and ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to give you tawfiq. The next question is going to be to Akhwan Abdurrahman. One of the questions that came forward is What are some of the fada'il of seeking knowledge? Some of the virtues of seeking knowledge. Taqriban. Lahum. Um, the virtues that knowledge has has been emphasized in the Quran and the Sunnah uh, plentifully. Allah Azza wa Jal, He praises knowledge and He praises the people of knowledge. He praises their status in this dunya and He praises their status in the hereafter as well. 
Allah Azza wa Jal, He says that He raises the people, those that have Iman amongst us, and He raises those with knowledge to higher levels. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions that the people who carry knowledge, they testify to the greatest testification and testimony, which is the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal. So these people of knowledge never attained that status and that loftiness except through knowledge. The first thing that was said to the Prophet وسلم, of revelation was Iqra, read. And Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, the one place where he commanded the Prophet وسلم, to increase, or to seek an increase of something was knowledge. He said, and say, my Lord increase me in knowledge. That's the only thing in the Quran that Allah Azza wa Jal commands the Prophet to seek an increase of, not an increase of wealth, not an increase of uh, status. He was told, and say, my Lord increase me in knowledge. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he praised and he emphasized the importance of having knowledge and seeking knowledge. And he said that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. And the Prophet وسلم, he gave the example of those that have knowledge compared to the worshippers, the monks that have little knowledge but they engage in a lot of worship. He said, Mithalul Alimi. Uh, he said that the example of the, the, the scholar compared to the worshipper is like the moon compared to the stars. It outshines. Mathalul ala al-abidi al qamar ala sa'il al-kawakim As the Prophet وسلم, he said that the difference between the scholar and the worshipper is like the difference between the moon and the rest of the stars. And it is encouraged highly. Our religion is not a religion that tells you uh, to be upon ignorance and to keep you in the dark and that there's only an elite that can seek knowledge and that knowledge is only with them and they're the only ones that you can go to to seek that knowledge. The knowledge is emphasized and it's encouraged to learn by the young, by the old, by men, by women and it is something that will help you uh, throughout your lifetime. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, أَفَمَنْ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مَنْ رَبِّكَ الْحَقُّ كَمَنْ هُوَ أَعْمَى Is, are they the same? The one who knows that the truth, the truth that has been revealed to you from your Lord and the one who is blind, are they the same? So, this, the person who doesn't have the knowledge that Allah Azza wa Jal has revealed in the book and the sunnah and is ignorant of it, is this dispraised. It is dispraised. And what is encouraged, in fact, is that you learn and you acquire. And knowledge is the best thing that you can have. It, it makes clear for you the path. This path that we're upon to Allah Azza wa Jal. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal, He allows us to all die upon it. It makes it clear for you. Allah says, فَمَنْ كَانَ عَلَى بَيِّنَةٍ مَنْ رَبِّهِ كَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوءُ عَمَلِهِ Is the one who is upon clear guidance and clarity from their Lord like the one whose evil action has been made beautiful for them? The answer is no. This is the path that Allah Azza wishes for us that we learn, we acquire and we act upon what we uh, learn. And one of the scholars he said in some lines of poetry about knowledge and how sweet it is. He said that had you only had a taste of it, of learning and studying the religion, you would have picked it over any other thing. فَلَوْ ذُقْتَ مِنْ حَلْوَاهُ طَعْمًا لَآثَرْتَ التَّعَلُّمَ وَجْتَهَدْتَ If you were just to have a taste of 
the, the knowledge that is sitting in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu then you would have chosen it over everything else and would have worked hard for it. So this is just a tip of the iceberg in the virtues and the merits that knowledge has. But my advice is to everybody that they learn and the best knowledge that you can have is about Allah Azza wa Jal and his names and his attributes. And that you learn about Allah and you learn about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You learn and take time in your day, in your week, to study. Alhamdulillah, the means of learning are plenty. Al-an, alhamdulillah, people are watching us from their homes. You are here, alhamdulillah, the, you, can, you can listen to audio. And now there is translations for the scholars that you can watch and you can benefit from. That. There's books that have been translated. Uh, there is uh, videos that have been translated and clips. So my advice to every Muslim is that they take time f from their day to learn and to, to acquire this knowledge that Allah that will lead you to the path of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Jazakallah khair wa ahsan The next question is to our brother because he's going to leave early he has to go back to Cardiff Akhuna Muhammad a brother asks what advice would you give to someone in regards to learning the Arabic language? Wait, okay. Um, the Arabic language. Number one, the first advice I would say is be sincere in the reason why you're learning the Arabic language. It should be so that you can directly benefit from the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Directly benefit from the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ without needing a, a translator. So you can actually increase in Iman when you hear the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understand it. And wallahi you will see the difference in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you understand the Arabic language and you can hear the speech of your Lord and you understand it. And you feel as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking directly to you. That impact on your heart is completely different. It's a feeling you've never felt before. It's as if you're hearing these verses for the first time. The English translation and the, the direct Arabic meaning and understanding you will get, shaitana ma Allah. It's a big difference. So have sincerity but the effect it will have on you the effect it will have on you so be sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to aid you and to guide you number two is make sure you have a teacher who teaches you Arabic and a teacher who teaches you a good curriculum that if you put in the hard work for a certain amount of time, at the end, you will come out understanding the Arabic language. And the Arabic language is not difficult to learn. Wallahi, if you apply yourself one year, year and a half, two years max, you will come to the end understanding Arabic. Understanding the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you stand in Taraweeh in the month of Ramadan, increasing you in Iman, you come, you go abroad, you sit in one of the majalis of the mashayikh, you don't need a translator. You can understand directly what the sheikh is talking about. Benefits from the sheikh directly. It will allow you and open up doors of knowledge for you. Because the reality is, you can only learn and seek knowledge in the English language to a certain level. There's a wall you're going to hit. And the only way you can go over that wall or break through it is by understanding the Arabic language. There's certain sciences of the religion that you will not understand unless you know Arabic. The perfect example of this is Usul al-Fiqh. Usul al-Fiqh you can't understand unless you know Arabic. It relates directly to the Arabic language. And the thing about Usul al-Fiqh is that it's not specific to Fiqh. It applies to Aqidah, it can apply to Tafsir, it can you apply to Hadith. It's tools that help you understand the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. And it applies directly to the Arabic language. 
So if you don't have access to the Arabic language, you won't have access to that. And if you don't have access to, access to that, then your highly likely, or your understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah is very highly likely for it to be, or there's a possibility it might be wrong. If you yourself try and understand and use what you have to understand, or, yani, extract benefits from the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. You need to do it in accordance to how the Sahaba understood it. And you will see that the science of Usul Fiqh is extracted from the text of the Quran and the Sunnah and the Arabic language. طيب. What do you study? If you want to learn Arabic, what do you study? How can I now, if I start today, if I start tomorrow or this week coming up, one year, year and a half, two years, I want to learn Arabic. What do I do? You'd see, I mean, there's difference of opinion in terms of the advice some of the brothers might give you. I and mean, some of the ikhwah here from Medina might give you a different opinion on some of the books they prefer. Okay? Which is khair. But I, let me give you my advice and maybe the brothers can add what they want. So, and this is how I learned the Arabic language. And why I benefited. The books I benefited from the most were al arabiya Bayn Why? Because it helped me build a, a vocabulary a base of, of vocab so that when it came to studying the whole grammar and stuff and all of these different things it was a lot easier so what advice would I give? I would say a person should start off with Arabi Ibn Adik book 1 once they've completed that study a small book in Sarf Sarf will teach you how the Af'al and the Asma so the, the verbs and the um, nouns change right? and how you can use, how you can use one word in many different ways Study a small book in Sarf, right? I would recommend uh, Sarf for the Mubtadi'een. It's very small, very good. Then move on to Arabiya Bayni Idik book 2. Study the first chapter. After you've studied, not chapter, I mean first juz, because it's split up into two ajza, two um, books. Study that. After you've studied that, ask your teacher to, your teacher to teach you al ajrumiya but the way he's going to teach you. It's not for you to know how to do i'rab and all of these different things, no. You want to learn the basic grammatical rules so you can differentiate between what is an ism, what is a fi'l, when, when do I use ta, when do I use ya, when do I use the hamza, right? And all of these different things. So you have a basic understanding of nahu, now you have a basic level of nahu, a decent level of sub. Carry on with your, um, the other books of al arabiya Bayn The last part, book two, book, book three, and book four. Now, when you're studying, you're going to have a notebook. This notebook is going to be considered to be your vocabulary bank. Every new word you come across, you're going to put it in this notebook. After, let's say, 15, 20 words, what you're going to do is, you're going to use those words and you're going to write paragraphs. Make things up. Talk about your day, write a story, act as if you're talking to someone, just so you can use these words. Now that you know self, you're going to use these af'al in different ways, right? You can use the asma in different ways, the verbs in different ways and the nouns in different ways. You're going to do this up until you complete book four, right? Even if you want to do up to book three, ahla wa sahla. Why? Because book four at the end it's more of like adab, uh, ad, uh, al-adab al-arabi, Arabic literature and stuff like that. By the end of that, you would have a, a basic level of Arabic grammar, a decent level of self, and you would have a lot of Arabic words that you would understand and can use in many different ways. Now, is that enough for you to go and open up the uh, books of the Sharia and books in Aqidah and Hadith and Fiqh to start understanding it? It's, it's good because it will help you understand it, but you will need a teacher to help you to adapt to some of the uh, words that are used in يعني, the realm of the Sharia. When we're talking about the ulum. Why? Because you'd see that words are used in certain ways and in certain contexts and there are certain phrases that are used in the books of Aqidah, in the books of Fiqh, in the books of Usul, in the books of Tafsir, in the books of Hadith. Every word is Arabic. Sometimes you'll understand the word. But the phrase you may not necessarily understand because you're not used to that type of, of speech. So that you would get through studying in the books of the smaller books. Yani, and this yani, then this will lead us on to talking about what you would do if you want to start seeking knowledge properly and you want to become grounded in knowledge. Now, try and find a teacher. A teacher that knows the Arabic language, 
will be consistent in terms of teaching you, right? And he doesn't have to be the best. As long as he can teach you Arabic, alhamdulillah, you'll benefit. Sometimes, if he can only teach you one part of that stage that I talked about, alhamdulillah. I remember, an Arabic learning day, I studied it under a brother who went to Egypt for three months. He, he was not the best in the Arabic language. What, what can you get done in three months? You can get to an okay level. But he told me, I'll give the painting big book one. I said, Alhamdulillah. Let me try and find someone else to teach me book two. I looked online, watched some videos here or there. I was, yani, I was doing the best with whatever I could find. Alhamdulillah, eventually, through those two years of hard work and, you know, trial and error, I made it out at the end to a, a, a decent level of Arabic language. And this was all in Cardiff. I, haven't, I didn't travel abroad. But now if you can find a teacher somewhere here in Birmingham, if you can find a teacher online, right, to teach you two days in the week, minimum two days in the week, one day in the week, so enough. Minimum has to be two days in the week, at least three to four hours in the week. Maybe two hours one day, another two hours the other day, an hour and a half, an hour and a half here. Wallahi, if you put in your efforts, and the thing about the Arabic language is, you can't always rely upon the teacher to do everything for you. The teacher is going to give you the keys, you have to put in the hard work. When you get home, you're doing your homework. You're practicing. You're not shy if you make mistakes. It doesn't matter if people laugh. At the end of the day, you're going to learn Arabic. You're going to make mistakes. You're finding new words, you're watching videos, the Arabic videos, or mashayikh, uh, the videos of the mashayikh in Arabic with the English translation, and you're trying to pick up on the Arabic words. You're putting in extra work so you can learn more. This is the only way. You can't depend upon your teacher, right? They teach you everything. You have to put in the hard work. And with Allah Ta'ala, you will reach a decent level or a good level of the Arabic language. Um, even if it means that you have to find a teacher from Egypt or from back home or someone that you even have to pay a certain amount of money, pay that money. Your benefits. You pay your road tax, you pay your insurance, you pay your bills, you pay your rent, you pay for food, you pay, some people pay for gym, you pay for this, you pay for that. Even if it's a small amount of money and he's going to teach you the Arabic language and you'll benefit. Always think of it like that. How can I learn Arabic? Who can teach me? I need a good teacher. He's consistent. It doesn't matter if I'm in a whole class. As I just want to learn Arabic. Bi'idhanillah ta'ala, you will reach bi'idhanillah. Allah ibn al-Fiqh. As for uh, Medina syllabus and Benny uh, Adik, he talked about it in detail in a podcast called Medina or Qasim. He talks about the differences. All of us are from Medina. He's from Qasim University. So he's got detailed podcasts, you can go back to that. Medina or Qasim, Muhammad Abdul Rahman on YouTube. Hey, the next question is to, let's go to this side and come back to this side. Hey, Akhuna Usama. The question to you here is, my brother asks, how can we deal with, yani, uh, when, when a person who has started seeking knowledge, he knows the virtues of knowledge, he started his path of learning Arabic. But then his zeal and ambition has gone down, maybe he stopped attending the lesson. What can he do? What advice could he give such a person? Because he goes, all of us go for, for talk. What advice can you give to up that zeal and, and continue that ambition for that student? Zagullah. <clears throat> in terms of zeal, then in terms in terms of the the realm or the theme of seeking knowledge and your zeal then it's important to remember that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi informed us that there are going to be times
there, there's going to be times like that where your enthusiasm is going to be higher than other times. And this is something that the Muslim has to instill within themselves. Ma'rifa and realization of that. Because the increase and the decrease of Iman as it relates to the Muslim is a sifa and a characteristic which is lazimun lahum. It is going to happen. You are bound by it. You are not going to ever avoid the decrease of Iman or the decrease of zeal. It's going to happen naturally as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu informed us. So the first thing to do and to recognize is not to be in a situation where you're panicking or worrying about that. What we should be doing that whilst we know that is the case is planning what we do during that circumstance. That when you feel that zeal for aim decrease a little bit, you need to have a plan about what you should be doing in order to bring that zeal back up. And from the first things, or one of the most beneficial things that help in regards to bringing that zeal back up, as it relates to knowledge, is reading the Quran, especially those verses or those suwar which talk about the akhirah and talk about the ones who are successful in the hereafter. That's the first thing. Iqfar and being more plentiful in reading the Quran during that time. Secondly, is train yourself as much as possible in having tikrar and repetitively reading the seerah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there are plenty of books out there which summarize the seerah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we're not talking about trying to over a detailed biography of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, during a time when your zeal is weak. There are mukhtasarat. Yeah? There are poetries, short poetries, poetries of the seal of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, like Al Ajuz of Yeah? Hundred lines of poetry about the seal of the Messenger of Allah. وسلم. Memorize it and read about the trials of the Messenger of Allah and how he remains steadfast during those trials, how we remained teaching the Sahaba during those trials and during those periods. Thirdly, I would also encourage with the reading of some of the Siyar, of some of the Sahaba, and some of the Imam of Hadith specifically, the likes of Ahmed and other than them and his Mihna, and how he took account of himself and grabbed hold of his own soul in order to continue making bayan of the haq whilst being on the severe trial. Imam Ahmed never stopped making bayan of the haq and clarifying the haq whilst being on the trial. He carried on going. So it's almost like during these times when the zeal goes down, you have to, it's almost like saying riding the wave. You just have to keep on going as much as possible. You might not do as much as you would usually would do, but you maintain a level where you keep on going. What you will find, that if you keep on doing it after a while, is that if you find that even during the times where your zeal goes down, because you're in a habit now of seeking knowledge. You're in a habit of picking up a book and trying to gather benefits. That when the zeal goes down, you'll find that the guilt 
of you not actually doing that is enough to actually actually get you back up and to continue doing it. One day goes by, you know what, I didn't do that half a page in the morning, you know. And your day feels horrible, your morning feels horrible. And then you have the daily ibtila ads through the day. And then you realise at the end of the day, like, you know what? We have to be thankful for the blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal. But what did I take from the day? You know, after that day, it means I could have done that Quran. It wasn't that bad. Yeah? So the guilt alone is enough for you to keep, is enough for you to bring your zeal back up. Secondly, also, I would also say, is try to have a companion who shares similar goals to yourself, who shares a passion of seeking knowledge. Because what can happen between the two of you is friendly competition, masabaka. Yeah? I remember when I first got into the club, yeah, I think in the first few years, or the second year in the Jamia, um, you want to try and prepare to go to the Kuliya. So I used to have a friend who every morning he would knock on my door and he'd say, Come. And every morning we would go down to the Masjid bin Baz, the old Jamia, the old Masjid in the Jamia, and memorize a page of Bulug al Maran. And we used to, the competition between us was who could not only memorize it the quickest, but who can say it the quickest. Who can go through that page quickly. So we'll be back and forth, back and forth, trying to say this page as quickly as possible every morning. So it's always good to have a companion that can challenge you and you can keep up with. Sometimes you might, you might even be better than you, but you do it. Yeah, he might have a better memory than you and he can go through two pages with you. You do it. Yeah, he keeps on pushing you. He reminds you of the goal. Yeah? So it's always good to have a companion or a friend that shares a goal as well. I think these are the main things that helped me through, particularly in the journey a lot. And in the West as well, where your daily timetable is not necessarily now. You have that day to give up, you have other things to attend to, then it's always a, a, a good idea to cling on to these things which keep the zeal going as well, especially when you're living. The next question is to Akhuna uh, Bassam. One of the questions they said, or they asked, What advice would you give yourself? Hindsight, looking back, what advice would you give yourself before you went to Jana? Um, what I would say is um, Learn how to seek knowledge. Everything has a method. Seeking knowledge has a method. When you go there, it's like someone just falling into an ocean and you don't know what you're to swim. You've got all these scholars teaching. You're, you're like on, on a sugar rush. You want to sit everywhere, take everything at once. And you barely know Arabic. If, or you don't know Arabic. So you need to have a mindset of what I'm going to do when I get there. And this is again, you want to ask the people that are graduates and achieved much and also read books on this, how the scholars have mentioned that seeking knowledge is, is there's a method to it. You can't just go anywhere you want, pick up something here, pick up something there, and you not have a structured way to seek knowledge. Um, but what uh, tends to happen with, you know, I can't say for all students, but I think from my uh, perception, what seemed to be happening was a lot of students were going there who didn't even know Arabic. They instead of focusing the Arabic and mastering it within the two years, they would do a bit of Arabic, neglect their homework, run to this sheikh, this sheikh, take something from there, something from there, and by the end, they may not even know Arabic properly. Because 
the Arabic programs, they need to teach Arabic. The Sheikh is teaching you Kitab al Tawheed, he's teaching you Fatul uh, Bari. That's not designed to teach you Arabic. So everything needs to be in stages. You need to make sure what you're doing is in the correct way. And go to an alim to, to say, what should I do? No, don't take your Western advices and go there. Go to an alim or a transfer of student knowledge that's actually graduated. Ask an alim, Sheikh, I'm doing this. I'm in the ma'had and I'm doing this. I barely know Arabic. Get someone else to ask him because you wouldn't be able to ask him. Should I be attending five lessons a day, two lessons a day, or five lessons, sorry, five lessons a week, whatever it is? Or should I be focusing on and making sure I get 100% of my Arabic before I move on? Or maybe get focused on Arabic and the Hafz of Quran and being able to read Quran properly. And maybe attend one lesson a week with the Ali, you know, just so I keep in touch and uh, etc. Because the student feels like they, they, uh, some students, they may act like tourists, you know, they're there, they're going to go soon. That's you, if you're an Umrah, maybe you can do that. If you're there for six years, so make a, again, this is my second point, have a timetable, have a plan. And obviously aim high, aim to be a scholar, as the brother said before in his advice, aim to be a scholar. But then again, say for example, the first year what I'm going to do, I'm going to do focus on Arabic thing. I'm going to go to a sheikh once a week. You know, because I want to be able to sit in the majalis of the ulama and get accustomed to that. And I'm going to make sure my qira'ah is good. Because once you memorize and your makharij is bad, then it's like you have to re-memorize. It's very hard to correct. It's like double the work. Your heart and your line, is it okay? Your hands and your hat. Don't, don't feel like you're too proud. I know this. I don't need to do this anymore. Because you may have been taught wrong. So make sure you get you read to a muqri and make sure that your makharij are right um, and, and you have a timetable and you have an aim right uh, that's what I would say um, what else can I think of? I think that's it really and remember there is a method to seek your knowledge the next question is to Akhuna Abdullah Khamis Ali Gandhi Akhuna, the question to you is, is two questions. Two people ask the question, it's similar, so I'll merge it together. How would you seek knowledge whilst being married? And the second, we'll merge it together. What advice could you give on balancing knowledge and getting married or supporting a family? And this is from me, third point, the same thing. Does marriage stop you from seeking knowledge? Is it a obstacle? As for the first one, how can you seek knowledge and support family? Is that correct? No. Uh, how to seek knowledge whilst yeah, the same thing. Okay, yeah. How to seek knowledge whilst having a family. So this is something that a lot of the people do believe, unfortunately, they do believe it's an obstacle. Meaning having a family, a wife, a wife and children, it's a means of you not being able to progress and seek knowledge. But I personally believe and one knows best that it goes back down to the person. Okay, if you are a man and you decided to take on that responsibility, which is to get married, then you know, and you should know, that you're going to have a responsibility where you have to care for them and look after them. So for example, I'll speak from experience, let's say for example, you're living in a Muslim land, you've been accepted to study, or even if you're in a place where you're trying to study, having a family should aid you in seeking knowledge. Okay, having a family should aid you in seeking knowledge. And by that I mean, if you chose the right spouse, as we mentioned in the lesson earlier, and they also had an intention, or they have an intention, and they want to aid you in getting closer to Allah Azza wa Jalla and entering them into those Allah then the only way that they're going to be able to be of some sort of uh, obstacle is if they were completely against seeking knowledge and getting closer to their Lord Jalla Jalla. But rather, if they are from those spouse that youths you know, decided to get married to, then they should only aid you in 
seeking knowledge. Now, the question, answering the question, how do you balance it? Meaning you're seeking knowledge and you have commitments, you have responsibility, a wife or children, or both. It's actually related to the brother, what he said, in terms of having a timetable or method. You have to have a timetable. Now, when you have a family and you have that responsibility, the best way should be, for example, Giving you guys a simple example, a timetable. If you have dirasa from, you have studies from morning until door time, okay? The easiest way that will make you be able to benefit and also be able to balance it is you should try. And there are centers, alhamdulillah, in Medina where you can send your wife to also benefit different marakis. So you go in the morning and you drop her. Okay, you go in the morning to your jamia and you drop her to an institute where she's able also to learn. Now, what's the benefit of this? The benefit is you're going to go and seek knowledge for the sake of Allah. She's also going to seek knowledge. When you come back, you can discuss that which both of you benefited from. Okay, so therefore you're learning, but she's also learning. Because brothers, you have to understand that if you're there, and many people do this unfortunately, they go... They study for all those hours, okay, and they leave their wives in between four walls for six years. Imagine doing that to someone for six years. What, how is their mental state going to be? Just six years, they're sitting down, you've graduated, you've learned, you've sat with Mashaykh, she comes back, she doesn't, even, she doesn't even know the difference between Ayn and Alif. There is no benefit there because as the ulama, they say, the greatest way to know that you've benefited is look at your family members. Look at your direct family members, your wife and children, how much of the knowledge have, that you have, have you given back to them? If you can answer and you can say, yes, mashallah, they know the fara'id, they know the sunan, they know the ahkam and what have you, then you would know that you have actually benefited because your family in front of you is benefiting. And a means, okay, let's say something, say maybe my family is not able, my wife is not able to go to the institutes. The best way to be able to maintain that is you have to have a method, you have to be smart. You have to have a means of income, okay? You have to have a means of income that will enable you to last with your family members out there in those kind of lands. So you have a means where you're studying in the morning, okay? And when you go and study in the mornings, when you come back, you also revise and benefit and teach her and your children that which you benefited. And afterwards, in the evenings, you can go and make an income, okay? A way to survive and live there. That's, generally speaking, the easiest way for someone to do it. And this is my advice, I'll say, for the first part, is that you have to balance it out. So you have a method, a timetable, where you know you're going to benefit, you're going to seek knowledge, but at the same time, you have to have a means of income, a source of income, that will enable you and support you and your family members. That's the first type. Uh, the second question, I believe, is... How can we answer that? Okay, the second question... Is it an obstacle? Yeah, is it an obstacle? It's not an obstacle. Having, uh, being married is not an obstacle in terms of you seeking knowledge, like I mentioned. It should be a means of you aiding. And a simple example, Khani, is let's say you've got the dirasa in the morning, you've gone to your class, you've come back, whatever time table you had in the morning, you've taken the children to school, you did your rounds, okay? And it's, it's now evening times. So when you're in that moment of time when you have your wife and your children in the car, utilize it. Give her the mushaf if you've had, you've got Quran class or you've got hadith you need to memorize, whatever. Give her the mushaf and you read unto her, recite unto her, make her correct you. But she won't be able to do this if she can't read Arabic. So it goes back down to what I first said. You have to teach your wife and children the basics so they can also aid you. You're getting them involved. The reason why a lot, and I know plenty, more than 20 on top of my head, why a lot of families who want to leave Medina, you know, Medina living there or supporting their husbands, why they want to leave and not stay in those environments, which many will be like, that doesn't make sense, why would they want to leave such a beautiful place, is because they're not actually involved. They're just literally just there physically. They're not involved with that which the husband is doing in terms of seeking knowledge. But if you get your wife and children involved, then they will be able to enjoy it and they'll be able to aid you even more. So it won't be an, obst an obstacle, but rather it will be that a means of helping you and aiding you. They will encourage you. They'll make sure you're early on time for lesson. They'll make sure that you've revised. They'll even help you get certain things ready with regards to your dirasa. But this can only happen if you bring them into that circle of knowledge. 
If you haven't brought them into that circle of knowledge, you haven't shown them how beautiful this knowledge is, you haven't taught them that hadith, man salaka tariqin yattabi sufi ilman sahal Allahu lahu or sahal Allahu bihi tariqin al jannah, all these things, if you don't teach them how beautiful knowledge is and the virtues of it, they won't have an interest for it. And if you don't get them involved, then it's going to be very difficult for you. So, just to conclude, it's not an obstacle being married, but rather it should help you. Then when children come along in the picture, you also send them tahfid, you make them learn, you bring them with you to the likes of these gatherings and the gatherings of the Mashiach, so they can see at a young age that this is what I should be, I, I want to aspire to be like my father or my mother, and what have you. And I'll conclude with that, Mubarakullah. <laughs> The next question is to Abdurrahman, and the question is How do we memorize? And what advice or techniques would you give in terms of memorizing? Okay. Um, so memorizing, of course, is an important part of learning, studying, um, and from the ways to memorize is that you say, for example, if you memorize on Quran or you memorize in poetry or a book, that you take it in portions. If it's Quran, you memorize three ayahs at a go, for example, four ayahs, five ayahs, you know, as, at a go. And you do takrar, you repeat. And of course, everyone's got their own methods. Even every land, might, people from different countries might have their own methods in uh, memorizing. But what you can do is that portion that you're memorizing, uh, you repeat. You repeat an amount of times. They say that if you don't if you don't repeat a, a, a around seventy times, seventy times, then it's not yeah, you know, it's not memorization. It's not hif. 70, 100, 200 times, just that portion, just that portion, repeat it, and then some even say that if you repeat that 100 times, then inshallah you'll never forget it, if you repeat that portion, set 100 times, then you'll never forget it, what can assist in memorizing as well is that you pick the time that you're memorizing, certain time that you're memorizing, uh, after Fajr or before Fajr or um, some may even argue that before, before you sleep um, where you are also helps if you're somewhere busy where people are talking or people it's noisy, it's not, that's not going to help you if you are uh, some recommend that you go sit sit by somewhere secluded by a wall and you repeat and you memorize um, likewise within yourself then you should abstain and stay away from your eyes seeing things that will harm your iman and harm your knowledge because I mean, Allah Azza wa assist us in doing so um, because the knowledge that is given by Allah is light and is known from Allah uh, and that nor it requires that we preserve it by keeping our eyes away from things that we shouldn't be seeing. And if it does so happen that we fall into these things that Allah, we ask Allah for forgiveness and we continue. We shouldn't let that hinder us. Um, as everyone might know the story where Imam Shafi'i he went to his teacher, Waqi ibn Jarrah, rahimahullah ta'ala, and he complained about uh, he saw the ankle 
on a shin of a woman. And he said that this affected my knowledge and my memory. Just the shin he saw. And that affected him and he went to him and sought advice. And Imam, uh, Imam uh, Waqir ibn Jarrah, he told him some wise words and he told him to stay away from sinning because the knowledge is light from Allah and Allah doesn't give his light to the one that is engaged and always sinning. So Shakotu ila waqi'i su'a hifdi fa'arshadani ila tarkil ma'asi wa akhbarani bi anna al-ilma nurun wa kama qal wa nur Allahi la yuhdahu aasi wa la yu'tahu aasi yu'tahu aasi where he said basically what I just mentioned he said I, I complained to Waqiyah my bad memory and he guided me to leaving of sin and he said that this knowledge is light from Allah and Allah doesn't give it to the one who is a sinner so that's within yourself the timing we've mentioned the timing that you should choose to memorize the domain and the location you are when you're memorizing how much you memorize يعني, you should take it uh, bit by bit, not too much you can't memorize everything at one go um, you take it bit by bit today a portion and tomorrow a bit like it from the knowledge that is taken and this is how you acquire so the portion shouldn't be too much you repeat it a certain amount of times a hundred times, inshallah that's khair, two hundred times. We hear that the people in Mauritania, they memorize a tremendous amount of times. So they'll face north and repeat a hundred times. They'll face east a hundred times, west, uh, south a hundred times, west a hundred times. They'll keep on repeating and that's nothing to them. So the amount that you're, of course, it's not possible that you're, you're repeating so much that many times. It has to be a short, a, a small portion. Repeat, drill it. Keep on drilling and inshallah it will remain. And then the next day, another portion, drill and revise. As you keep on going forward, you go, you, you, you revise and you move forward like that. You don't burn the bridge that's behind you. As the further you go, you're burning what's behind you. you, know, you you, you do muraja'ah and you revise as you go along and as you go forward. But I'm sure the brothers might have their own methods. And as I said, it's, there's no one way to memorize. But what I would recommend is at a young age that you should, you should memorize. Whilst you're young, you should strive to memorize. Because Imam al-Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that famous statement, a ta'alum of his sirah, learning at a young age, can naqshif al hajar. It's like inscribing in stone. When you inscribe in stone, nothing will remove that. Uh, so, at your young age, memorize the Quran, and that should be the first thing, the first station that we arrive at when we're learning the religion of Allah, that we memorize, that we learn the words of Allah, and we memorize them, and then everything else can come after Allah. I'm just going to add two more points to that one. One is if you have a weak memory, don't despair, because your memory is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. The less you use it, the weaker it gets. So it becomes something that you get accustomed to. Another thing is using your different senses. This is an advice of Sahih al me. Use your eyes, use your ears, read aloud. Use your, uh, use your hands to write it down. So using your different senses as well reinforces uh, that what you have memorized. Well, thank you. The next question is going to be to Afona Sama. And I have to give a little introduction first. Context. So Afona Osama is a reader. And one of our brothers earlier, Nasr, 
the mission is never here. Yeah. <laughs> finished the Quran in his Ariba, finished the Quran in nine months. Last year, read it to Akhwana Shaykh Abdurrahim. Finished it in nine months and he was a weaver. One of the brothers that taught me Arabic, personally, some of the brothers are not Muslim, he taught me Arabic, he was a weaver from America, Texas. And Akhwana is a graduate and is a weaver and got accepted to masters, but he never continued. What ad- this is a question, what advice would you give to weavers that have entered into Islam that sometimes think that we can't reach the level of memorizing Qur'an, I'm a reaver, I started late, or I can't seek knowledge, or I can't be a teacher. This is something, a shubha that some people might have. What advice would you give them in terms of seeking knowledge, or, or, or generally speaking, that this is not the case? Bismillah. In terms of Oh, what we're discussing is all we're talking about is having lofty goals and having high goals <coughs> as it relates to seeking knowledge of the Deen of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and having high goals in this regard is devoid of whether you're somebody who is a uh, what I call a revert to Islam or not, it's absolutely irrelevant. Um, when we look back at some of um, you know the seer of you know some of the imma, the best of them as well. Um, for the most part, some of them were probably born into Islam what their grandfather's words or their grandfather's grandfather's words or they weren't even Arab they weren't Arab, they were not familiar or they never came from a family whose tongue was familiar with the Arabic language so I think those kind of barriers are irrelevant I think the main thing is or definitely the main thing is is that once you've set your eyes on the goal and what it is you want to do, then you continue to do it in that regard. So if you want to memorize Quran, then you go and memorize Quran. The main thing is, as the brothers mentioned to earlier, is that when you do so, you have a plan to do it. Yeah, you manage that himma, you manage that eye for the prize, if you like. Yeah. You learn how to control it and you set yourself out a plan and you carry on but i think you know when we look at some of from my experience and look at some of the you know the most beneficial brothers um, in the jamia and those who've come back and so on a lot of them are reconverts they came to islam they came from you know the darkness of disbelief you know kufr and shirk Alhamdulillah, Allah Azza wa Jal guided them to the light of Islam and they used that light in order to seek more light. Yeah? The one, some of the things that from my experience you find being a reconvert is because you come from darkness, you don't no longer want to be associated with it anymore. And the best way to disassociate yourself from that is through Ayn. It's through knowledge. So that desire not to return back to the darkness of you know mercy and covenant and disbelief and so on you should use that in order to further push you to see knowledge to an extent inshallah with ikhlas that you're far removed from that you know as came the hadith of Hudayfa uh, ibn Liman uh, when he asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, indeed, that we have come from, you know, uh, jahiliyyah and disbelief, and you've came to us with guidance. Is it going to be more darkness and disbelief after this guidance? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, yes. So, Hudayfi never stopped there. He said, okay, after that, 
is there going to be more guidance after that darkness returns? The mission of Joseph Smith said, yes, but it's going to be tainted. So they for us, well, what's his taint going to be? What? Um, he said, Fihi Dukhan, he's going to be tainted, he's going to be clouded. So the messenger also advised him that he said, he said, Du'atun, he said, call us at the gates of the hellfire. Uh, they will have your tongue, they will speak, they will speak with your tongue, they will dress in your libas. <coughs> the point being, or the shahid, or Muhammad shahid, is that to remove ourselves from the misguidance, the tainted misguidance, the guidance which is hidden amongst us, is to further seek knowledge, to memorize the Quran, to memorize those hadith. Uh, and it's always good as well, particularly when it comes to being a reconvert and memorizing stuff that you have a goal or a reason for memorizing those things. So for me, when I came to Islam, it was to, you know, um, for a lot of reconverts, you get this whole lot of energy and you start trying to read everything and all of us, everything, and you soon forget it. Yeah, you soon forget it. So what a good thing is to do is to learn your basics and for every basic thing that you learn, memorize the Bidaleel for it. Islam has five pillars. First, when we learn, we come to Islam, yeah? Memorize the Daleel, yeah? The pillars of Iman were told our six, as the Messenger of Allah said, memorize the Daleel. We know that we have to pray, memorize the Daleel. You will find, yeah? I mean the proof, sorry, the Daleel meaning proof, have one. The Daleel meaning proof. Memorize the proofs of those basic tenets of your religion, and if you keep on doing that, you'll find after a year or two you will have a lot. You will have a lot 365 days in a year. Imagine memorizing one hadith a day for a year. How many hadith in Sahih Bukhari? Not even Mukhtasab. It's be ready to call. About 2,000 more, yeah, without tikkah, without repetition. You memorize one hadith a day. You've almost memorized how much of Bukhari? Uh, one fourth of the book. Already. Of course, after you learn Arabic language, the brothers have advised. One hadith a day. Just imagine you took one ayah a day. Two years, three years, four years. It's a lot of Quran. Yeah? A lot of Nusus, a lot of texts. So what happens as a reconvert, as someone who is not born around the theme of Islam, your deen becomes built around texts, proofs. You know why you do this, you know why you make the law before Salah. You know how the Salah is performed, you know how the message of Allah is performed in Salah. Those times of weakness come. Particularly as we convert, they, they come regular during those, those early days after the Shahada. Those Shahwats, all of a sudden, the Shahwat that never came, they're coming now. Huh? But you've memorized those ayahs so that remind you of the hereafter. Hope for the Jannah, the punishment of the Nar. Yeah? You have these things memorized. Yeah? So these things keep the himma, keep the iman, keep you going. Yeah? Jazakallah khair wa ahsan Allah ilayhi. La'allah, this is the last question, inshallah, for Abdullah. The question comes from my sister. What advice would you give to students coming back from Egypt who have learn some Quran or learn some Arabic, maybe completed, maybe you haven't completed, to keep up with their studies when they come back to UK. A lot of a lot of people go to a lot more people go to UK, sorry, to Egypt because it's easier, there's not that many uh, regulations compared to Medina. So what advice would you give them to keep up with their studies after they finish or after they come back?
Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Generally speaking, that is even if the person hasn't gone to Egypt, but they've gone elsewhere, they start seeking knowledge and they have the basics of that which they need, they have the ilm al-ala, they have the basics of that which they need, the tools to maybe understanding some text, maybe 25% out of 100, Quran, then they need to carry on and continue, not to stop there, because I remember myself when I went to Egypt when I was very young, before I went to Germany, so I mean, yeah, when I was young, and I learned a bit of Arabic, okay, here and there, I was able to pick up a conversation, so I'm just speaking through experience, so you know the reason why you shouldn't do this. And I think I was like maybe 13, 14, went there, stayed there for two months, I learned the basics of how to speak, okay, just the basics. Understanding also 20%, maybe let's say 18%. I came back, had my GCSEs, I remember, and after a year, you know, the books started to close until I completely put up the shelf. That, you know, you've got the bust on top of it. And I carried on pursuing that which I needed to pursue with regards to my academic education. The Arabic went completely. So when I went to Medina, I knew nothing of nothing with regards to the Arabic language. So the advice I would give is that when, if you do have if Allah Azza wa has blessed you with the basics, even if it is small, then you need to continue. Okay? As the Prophet says in authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, The most beloved actions to Allah Azza wa Jal is a small, even if they're small, but continuous ones. The most continuous action, if it's continuous, you're doing something even if it's small and it's continuous, it's much more productive, it's going to have a better outcome. If it's continuous, then if you just do something all in one go and then you leave it eventually. So if you have come back from Egypt to the likes, then my advice would be to keep it up. If now you have the basics, memorize, join up to have a sheikh or a teacher that's going to teach you Quran that you're able to recite over. Because now you're able to read the Quran and you have the basic language of the Arabic language, so you're able to memorize and read and do muraja, go to a teacher. So that way, if you have a teacher, you're going to have someone on top of you, on top of your case, to memorize until you complete the Qur'an. That's the first thing. With regards to the Arabic language, then try your utmost best to speak Arabic and use that which you have. It's the same problem that a lot of the brothers have when they go to Jamia Islamiyah or the likes, that they have the Arabic language, they learn and they're in the Ma'had. They're there for six years. Ghasman meaning it's a must, they have to stay there, right? They're in the Ma'had, they're learning the Arabic language, but as soon as they leave that class, as soon as they leave just the classroom, not the building, they speak in English or French or German or whatever language they're speaking. So when they eventually graduate, their Arabic is not as strong because they didn't actually keep up that which they had. They didn't continuously use the Arabic language in the cars, in the taxis, in the haram and what have you. So the same thing applies to those that have left Egypt all the lights. When you do leave, carry on using that language, whether it's going to be an institute, you're going to sign up online, or a teacher or a class, even if you you know someone that can speak Arabic, use it. That way, that which you have won't have gone to waste. And that's the advice I believe I can give. And I think I should give a question to uh, Dr. Muhammad, since he's asked us a question. Inshallah, <laughs> alaikum. Um, the question I'll have is because a lot of people here, Zawm Makhida, ask you know, to seek knowledge and what have you. My question to you, what are the obstacles that can get in one's way? Let's say they've gone to Egypt or they've gone to Medina to study and they have all of that around them, but yet they came, they come back, some of them, with nothing. What are the obstacles that can create that? What are the means that can create a person being in such a blessed curriculum, institute, university, but yet they don't benefit anything? And how can one avoid it? So, there are many obstacles, many things that hinder a person from seeking knowledge or continuing to seek knowledge. Some people, this happens a lot, some people go to Egypt or they go to Medina or wherever they go to. And the biggest problem or one of the biggest issues that, 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 that occurs before you even land wherever you're going is not having the right intention. Not having the right intention. So to fix that problem, have a sincere intention that you're seeking knowledge to remove ignorance from yourself. Doing it for the sake of Allah to remove ignorance from yourself. 
You're not doing it to show off. You're not doing it so you can tell everyone else, ah, look, look, I went to Egypt, or ah, look, I got a certificate, I've actually gone to Medina, I come back. The intention has to be clean, clear, pure, to remove ignorance from yourself first and foremost. So that's the first part, intention. And the second issue as well is included in the intention as well, which is people not having niya after they've studied for three, four, five years, they don't have an intention to go back to their own people and to remove ignorance from them. These two things, these two things you should have in your intention. Imam Ahmed was asked about the intention for seeking knowledge, how should it be? And he said, he mentioned these two things, to remove ignorance from yourself, that's the first and foremost. Don't worry about somebody else teaching them how to do inheritance or teaching them how to do something else and you don't know how to pray properly or how to do it. Focus on yourself first. Remove ignorance from yourself, have the right intention. Secondly, have that intention. Inshallah, if you get some knowledge and you benefit something along five years, four years, six years, that you go back to your people and you remove ignorance from them with whatever, uh, yani, uh, however much knowledge Allah has blessed you with. Like, from the obstacles, um, who was it? Now, there are many obstacles. I will refer you to a book, inshallah. Shaykh Abdul Salam Barjis has a book called Obstacles of Seeking Knowledge. It's translated into English. It's a short book. Uh, I think it's like 50 pages or less. It mentions, if I'm not mistaken, 10 obstacles. Beautiful book. We'll turn back to that book for details. But in short, intention is one of the major issues. Um, another obstacle we could say is a lot of people think that seeking knowledge is something that is bilahir only, is something outward that you wear a thaw or that you wear a shamar and then you carry a book in your hand all the time and you have a pen here in his pocket. You just want good khair, no problem. That's all the lahir, that's all the outward that you go to the scholars, that you memorize, that you, that you take all the means that you have to do. This is all good. I'm not discouraging from that. It's all good. But what's more important is, is the bottom, is the inside. How that knowledge affects you in the inside, your heart, how pure is your heart. Are you only focusing on the outward and inside your heart? When you go home, you do sins. You're watching haram, you're listening to haram, maybe you're eating from haram, your money is from haram. That focus of the bar, that bargain should be more. And if a person is focused on what's inside his heart and his bargain, he will take those means to rectify his heart and focus in his heart. More so in those things that are in the bar and out. It's all good doing all those means. But if you're memorizing and you're doing all these outward things, and your inside is corrupt, Wallahi, you can be seeking knowledge for 10 years and you will not see the barakah of it. You see no blessing. When you see someone else, I've seen it with my own two eyes, someone else will come. Maybe he has the basics already, but he comes and he's in, he focuses on his inside and in two years, Wallahi, he gets more knowledge than the other person, whoever he was doing in 10 years. And you see that person, what he focuses on in the, in the bargain he will do, for example, I'll give you an example. He will focus strictly on salah. The one that's salah, everything is just apparent, apparent. You see him lazy when he goes to salah, he's late, he's not hadith on coming early to Jum'ah or praying in the front row and all of These are the things that are going to affect your heart, rectify your heart. But the one who is serious about that, he will focus on that. And I'll give one example and I'll, I'll, I'll actively be that. I have a, uh, I had a colleague of mine in Jamia, and all of these ikhwa, by the way, are my colleagues. All of these ikhwa are my colleagues, are my he, I, I came when he was graduating, 2014. He came before me a little bit. He came before me a little bit, two, three years. These are my seniors, and he came after me. So these are all my colleagues. But I have one of my colleagues. I was staying with him one time, and I can't remember what happened, but it happens, it can happen, it happened to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ missed salah one time, he overslept, when they were extremely tired from travel or the last. 
when we miss salah one time, we never miss the timing, we miss the jama'ah. We miss salat and jama'ah. Just the jama'ah, meaning congregation in the masjid. And I remember the brother made a big fuss about it. He was like, Muhammad, Allah was time. We miss the jama'ah. We miss the jama'ah. As if someone died. Right? Why am I telling this? It shows you that he cares more about what's going to affect his heart and what's going to benefit him than what anyone else thinks. He cares about his salah, praying the jama'ah, make sure he prays the jama'ah every single salah. And you see that he's now Mufid, Mustafid, people benefit from him. There's another brother who came before me in the jama'ah. He finished the jama'ah four years. He was, he was in Medina for five years. And he said, listen to this. This is what the Salaf used to say. He said, I have never prayed, I've never missed a congregation prayer, Salat al Jama'ah, for those four years that he was in Medina. Meaning, he prayed Fajr, Luhun, Asar, Maghrib, Isha, in the masjid for four years, five years straight, and he's never missed Jama'ah. It's deep. But that shows you, look, he's looking, he's looking for what's going to benefit his heart. And then you see, those are the people that benefit. So if you, so the, the shahid is, let's summarize this whole point. The point is, seeking knowledge alone, outwardly, is not enough. You need to work on your, your ibadah, that which is going to rectify your heart. You find that all of the scholars, every single scholar that reached the high station in knowledge, he's got something about him in worship that is high as well. He didn't just seek knowledge and memorize a lot like a computer and he doesn't worship Allah and he doesn't pray. All of the scholars, they do worship Allah. So these two have to be coupled. In the Salaf, they used to say, every time Allah has given you, every time Allah has given you knowledge, blessed you with knowledge, then bring about a new act of worship for Allah in your life. So Allah blessed you with some new knowledge that you left this conference. But if there's an act of worship that you don't perform, for example, praying in the night, you don't pray yet. Khalas, Allah bless you, pray at night. Allah bless you some more knowledge, memorize every month, oh, sorry, fast every Monday. Wa Imam Ahmed and the Salaf generally, if someone never prayed at the night, they say, how are you a student of knowledge and you don't pray at night time? It's like, you have to pray at night. Imam Ahmed, one time he brought a bucket of water, and inshallah I'll try to summarize this with this last quote. He had a bucket of water, and back then they had no taps and toilets and whatnot, so they would have a bucket of water to do with them. He gave him a bucket of water for a student that was staying over in his house for the night. He gave him the bucket of water, he left him, and he went back to his room. In the morning, at federal time he came, the bucket was still full. Meaning, what does that mean? He never used it, what does that mean? He never made wudu. So he was asleep, he never made wudu, he never prayed. That's what it means. So Imam Ahmed came back and saw the water bucket still full. And he said, Subhanallah, Talibu Hadidin, La Yusabi Fillay. A student of hadith, a person that's seeking knowledge of hadith and he doesn't pray at night. It doesn't make sense. That's how they were. So focus on ibadah a lot and, and don't. I don't just focus on the outward camera, kind of putting up in here. It's all good, it's mashy, there's no problem with that. But there's something more important. If you were scruffy and your, your, your hat is like this every day, but you're focusing your blabbing, that's more important. It's these, stuff, these other stuff, they're more kamilat if you like. They are things that uh, finish off in the max. And we'll round up with that. Shaykh um, Muhammad تختم لنا لا ليس سؤال تفضل شيخ